Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. Today's video, it's gonna be about the garage floor. The foam showed up, so let's go ahead and get this stuff installed. Now, before we go ahead and start laying the foam down, there's a few updates that I wanted to show you guys on the garage that me and my dad did this weekend. So, the first thing is, I went back and looked through the engineer's blueprints and I noticed that he wanted blocking every five feet uh, that you have a wall. So, because we got 12 feet tall walls, I was like, hey, that's probably not a bad idea. Let's go ahead and put more blocking in. I was only going to put blocking in where a horizontal OSB sheet ended. So, for example, right here, this would have been a 4x8 sheet sitting right in there. I was only going to put blocking up at the top so that you'd have a nailing surface where two uh, OSB sheets came together. And then I was going to put blocking here where a 4 footer would be and then to go all the way up. But again, I went back over my blueprints and I noticed that he wanted the blocking every 5 feet. And I was like, well, you got a 12 foot tall wall. It doesn't make sense to put in every five feet. Let's just go ahead and put it in every four. So no matter what, where we are, we'll have something to nail to wherever an OSB sheet ends. So went ahead and did that. The other thing I went ahead and did is I got to thinking, when you put roof trusses on, you don't really screw or nail up through the bottom of a double top plate and go into the truss because no one's going to do a three inch nail plus another inch or two to hit that uh, roof truss. So everyone usually always toe nails. Now, what I ended up doing with this wall is like I said, most people end up usually building a wall on the ground, standing it up and then bolting it down to whatever you're bolting it down to. So whether it's a sill plate, a bottom plate, your subfloor, you basically screw right down through the lower plate that you put on and that's how it attaches. Well, I kind of have a lower plate here, but that plate right there is only for the outside OSB. It's not at the bottom of these studs. So all of these studs had to be toe nailed and screwed down into the sill plate. So there's nothing that's going up through here securing it this way. So it got me thinking, if that's the same way that I'm toe nailing this way as I'm going to be doing a roof truss, why not put a bracket or a strap on it like you do on a truss? Now, most trusses, it were depending where you live, and in fact, I think you have to do it everywhere in the United States, you have to put a hurricane strap on. What a hurricane strap is, it, it's a Simpson strong tie or another manufacturer strap, and the face of it goes to the double sill plate, so you can screw and nail uh, a, that bracket to the upper top plate and the bottom top plate, and then the bracket turns, kind of goes up and sets in, and you can screw in or nail into your roof truss, and that keeps your roof truss more secure to your top plate. Now, obviously you're doing that because when you have an overhang on your wall, wind gets up under there and can pick your roof up and pull it off in a hurricane or, I mean, a tornado will probably take it no matter what, but um, it's to help keep your roof down. Now, the engineer for us actually wants two different brackets. He wants a normal hurricane strap and he wants another strap that'll sit in further and basically do what I did here. It'll sit on the top plate and then it'll also go in this way for uh, to the truss. So that truss is really gonna be on there. So again, I got to thinking, if we're spending all that time and doing all that work up there for the uh, trusses, why not do something similar again for the bottom plate or the bottom of the stud? So these handy little brackets, which these aren't 100% used for this application, these gussets are actually supposed to be turned up ways and they're supposed to sit in corners. So like if you have a floor joist or a, a deck joist going this way and it's bolted uh, to the outer plate, you're supposed to like stick that in the corner and that gives a little bit more uh, reinforcement so that floor joist doesn't want to like fall. But these were four inches or just under four inches so they can fit in here nicely. 
Um, I went ahead and alternated screws and nails because nails going down in this way can pretty much just pull out. So to have a screw going down, that'll give you more pull strength. And then I've got, I had extra, so I went ahead and just uh, put screws and nails and I alternated them all over the place. So you'll see four here in this pattern. Uh, this one is just another pattern. I just went ahead and hammered these all out. It was only like another 50 bucks or something, but to me that makes that stud a lot harder to pull up. And the other thing I noticed is two of these studs down here, I cut wrong and they were too short. So at 12 feet tall, I was able to just go up there and grab that stud and literally just pull it out from just having the nails and screws toe nailed into the sill plate. It was really easy. Now that I have a bracket like that with the screws and nails, this thing is going to be extremely hard to push or pull until we get the sheathing on and until we get the trusses on. So a little bit of extra insurance and that's why I went ahead and did that. Again, not a gusset specifically used in this application, but it ain't going to hurt. And since it wasn't in the engineer's plans, it's not like I'm doing anything wrong. Just again, a little bit of extra insurance. The other thing that we did is we got a bunch of outside bracing done. Uh, I think I did four on each side. Uh, we went ahead and plumbed up the walls and all these bracing are now holding everything nice and plumb. This side over here was a little bit harder to push in. So that's why you see we got two straps here. This was a thousand times easier than these straps over here, these uh, braces over here. Basically what we did is we screwed it up here, put in a uh, metal stake, then we took another two by six going this way, put two screws in right there, uh, really close together in the middle, and then my dad pushed up on this and made this kind of like a fulcrum point where it went like this. So basically that two by six, you just push, push, push up, and it's pushing this board as this two by six here is pushing up this way, it's pushing this wall forward. That ended up being really difficult for my dad. So we just went ahead and put these straps on and with straps and chains, you just crank down on that thing and this wall just went in like there was no tomorrow. It was easy as can be. So then we put up our bracing and locked it out and now we're good for this point right here to leave everything on for high winds and we should be able to put the trusses on. Everything will still be straight. Then we can take them off, take the braces off on the outside and then we can go ahead and do the sheathing. String, string. So right now, the only thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw a line down here where the stone is, because right now this is pretty flat. I still have a ton of stone left, so I'm going to redraw a line. I'm going to go five inches up here, and then I'm going to have to go up about eight and a half inches over here, and that's going to give me a eighth of an inch drop per foot to get out of this garage, because I really don't want to pay all this money in concrete. And I've got a bunch of stone left here that I should be able to get up a few inches and taper this down.
All right, so it's probably not perfect, but I went ahead and went, oh, I don't know, a good eight feet or more from the corner out to about here, spread some more stone. I got it up three and a half inches back there. So now it's three and a half inches taller than it is here. And then that concrete should start to have a nice slope. Again, it's not perfect, but if we got to spend a couple more bucks in concrete, it is what it is. But at least from back there out to about, again, I think I went out about eight feet or so. That'll give us uh, the beginning major slope. And then the rest of this, we can slope out and do it with the concrete and a uh, laser level. So I got the tractor bucket and pushed down, got it all pretty uh, flat and compacted, if you will. It's not perfect. I don't have a compactor and I don't know if I want to really go get one because those four by eight sheets are so big and they're so strong that when you put them down, they're going to form to whatever's underneath of them and the concrete is going to push everything down and compact it anyway. So I don't know if compacting is 100% needed. Uh, I do want to show you the pecs that I got. Uh, there were several different types at Menards. Uh, I ended up with this stuff. It's kind of the middle of the price range. It says it's from Germany. It's been being used for tons of years over there. It's by Oil Creek Plastics. Um, again, it was in the middle price range. It wasn't the cheapest stuff from like China, but it also wasn't the most expensive, which is kind of what I wanted by uh, Upanor. Upanor is a PEX A type material and what's good about that stuff is it's extremely flexible. You can make major bends with it. Uh, if you do accidentally kink it, you can apply heat to it and it'll re kind of shape itself. Uh, the PEX A's and PEX B's won't do that. I believe that's a PEX A um, or I'm sorry a PEX B or C so it's a lot more rigid. Uh, the problem with it is with the Upanor is just its price. I think it was $207 a roll. While this stuff over here, I think was only about 90 something. The cheap Chinese stuff is like $70 and I just didn't want to buy that stuff. Uh, the reviews are good on it. Um, the only thing that I, again, do like about the Upanor is because it's a PEX A and very flexible, you can use expansion fittings. So basically you put a sleeve over the pipe, put a tool in it, open it up, set your uh, fitting in, and then it'll re-shrink itself back down around the fitting. Now, what makes that so good is when you've got a pipe that can't expand like that, the inside diameter of the fitting is a lot smaller. I think a half inch fitting is more like three eighths on the inside where it goes through a fitting. So you get a pressure drop there. The uh, Upanor PEX A, since you're expanding it out, you can actually put in a half inch inside diameter fitting it'll go back around it and then you won't have a pressure drop because it'll be a half inch all the way through the pipe as again having to post a neck down when you do fittings or um, connectors or anything like that but at 210 dollars a roll it would have been over i think 2200 dollars just for the garage and basement and again i may not even use it so this stuff here i think was around I think I spent about 14 or 1500. I'll post it below uh, when I'm done and give you a link to the site. But uh, heck of a lot cheaper, uh, especially if I'm not going to use it. But it is for radiant floor heating, and there is a difference too. Uh, if you are looking at getting uh, some type of radiant floor, or even if you're going to run PEX through your house, save your money if you can, or spend the money where you need to. There is a uh, oxygen barrier on some of these pipes so what that basically means is if you put it in radiant floor the oxygen barrier helps keep oxygen out of the pecs and the reason why that's a problem is because if your boiler your pumps and everything are made of like cast iron or have metal components on the inside oxygen get in, gets in there and it can rust them out uh, you obviously don't need an oxygen barrier running from say your uh, hot water tank up to your faucet there's nothing to rust out in between there because most like sink faucets, uh, et cetera, are um, stainless steel. So, or made of some plastic internals. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but radiant floor heating, since it's kind of a closed loop system and it's always running to keep that oxygen out of there and to keep all your boilers and your pumps and everything running longer, you wanna pay more money for the oxygen barrier type PEX and not the ones without it. So that's why we went ahead and got this and we're going to go ahead and get that vapor barrier down now 
we're gonna start laying the foam. I'll probably check it with a level every now and again. If I see some high spots in the rocks, just go ahead and level them out and we should be done. And hopefully this week, I think Friday is the day right now. It is Monday uh, right now that we're gonna go ahead and pour. We can, we can get uh, Randall and the concrete trucks and everybody out here and go ahead and do a first finishing job for a concrete slab. So we're a little short. I think I calculated maybe to run the plastic this way instead of lengthwise. But like I said in another video, the garage floor is actually above grade. So we're coming up to uh, pretty much two panels down. And if you look out over here, grade is, well, it's hard to tell with the dimple membrane on but the grade here currently is well under the two block mark. I may come up here grade to about there, but we should be under, so it, again, it doesn't matter. We're above grade, it's a garage, it's not a basement. Uh, the fact that the rigid foam is closed cell, again, this stuff doesn't have any of the air that can get through, this is solid. So when water sits on this, it pretty much just sits on it and it can't get through. This, I believe, again, is technically classified as a vapor barrier. So even in the basement, I probably won't tape my seams. I will run up the wall a little higher. As you can see, I just kind of threw this on real quick. It's not running up the back wall. It's not running up the side wall. We've got a decent overlap there, but not a really big one here. But again, that's why I went ahead and bought the tongue and groove. So that way these panels sit together. That kind of makes a vapor lock there. And then I don't have to tape this either because, well, even in the basement, this will be down. So kind of saves on tape and doing extra work just to spend a little bit on this. This, I think, 100 foot roll was only like 40 bucks. So, and it's 10 foot wide. So not a big concern, again, on this, that we've got this little spot here that's not gonna be vapor barrier because it's gonna have this anyway. So the basin, I'll take a little bit more time. I'll show you a little bit more in detail how I'm gonna install that stuff. Uh, and again, running up the wall, making sure everything's nice and tight and uh, properly sealed because again, that's way below grade. So we're gonna go ahead and start laying these panels down. I'm gonna see just how flat it is, how much taper I need, if any taper is needed. And then we should be done for this and we'll start laying the PEX tubing. You can already see the vapor barrier is working. It rained for the first time in, oh gosh, since we poured the basement walls. I don't know when that was, a month ago or so. Uh, so this stone is wet and you can already see the sun is pulling that moisture out and the bottom of this vapor barrier is already getting soaked with condensation all the way down. So you can kind of see why you now and you need one. Uh, obviously once you get a house up, the basement shouldn't get any more water in it but any that does come in just from the underground where pressure may be pushing uh, moisture up through it's good to have something down whether it be foam or whether it be a vapor barrier just to keep your under slab a lot drier and your basement a lot drier Pretty simple and straightforward. Got all that done. One thing I noticed is that with the tongue and groove and working by yourself, it's a little difficult to get these together. So if you are doing it by yourself and you're in a basement slab, for example, where you really need this waterproofed and good, uh, obviously you can go ahead and tape your seams. 
so that way you don't have cracks like this for water to come up through obviously putting that vapor barrier down helps uh, drastically but this is uh, not hard to work with it cuts super easy I've got a saw that cuts uh, timbers in both directions so it's got big teeth and little teeth same thing I was using to cut the ICF blocks I can't remember what it's called but it's a Japanese style saw instead of what we use in America with a hand saw uh, because as you can see it's got little teeth on this side big ones on this side and it makes it super easy to cut timbers depending if you're cutting with the grain or against the grain and makes foam cutting whether it be closed cell or that open cell super super easy so now we're going to go ahead and figure out from here from the boiler what type of layout we want i only bought nine rolls of pex tubing so that's going to be six for the basement and three for the garage so we're going to have to be conservative because we are going to be a little short uh, but because we've got the foam because we've got two by eights because our osb panels or yeah the osb sheathing is going to have an r6 on it foam already plus you got an r30 within this cavity since this is going to be so super insulated already and our garage doors are an r18.4 i don't think we need to go ahead and uh, put these pecs like basically 12 inches on center. I'll probably start out at the outside edges and get them close So that stays warm, but the further I get in like in the center here That doesn't have to be super warm just really the edges of everything So we'll try to be conservative and see what type of 300 foot runs uh, That we can put down because I've never done this before but I've got a whole box of clips that I'll show you and a tool to make this super easy to put them down so let's go ahead and get started with that uh, project now. So here's the clips we got. When these first showed up, I thought I ordered a bunch of like AR magazines or something. They, they look like that, so many of them. Uh, but these individual clips, if you can see right there, they hold the packs directly down to the foam. Then we also went ahead and bought this gun, if you will, or tool that basically they load in here and swing down. Every time you push the handle down, it forces one of these clips down over top of the pecs, down into the foam, and with all these spikes on it, it's not going to want to lift back out. I've heard hit or miss on this guy. Uh, got it off Amazon, a Malco. So we're going to see how well this works and see if it can actually go with the uh, Malco clips. Uh, I don't know if somebody is using different types and maybe that's why they're not compatible. But we're going to go ahead and get this rolled out. I don't know how easy this is going to be because this PEX tubing, again, is not PEX A. So it's going to be pretty stiff. I may not be able to roll it out all by myself. So we're going to go ahead and see just if I can do it myself and uh, how difficult it is and see what type of runs we can do. No instructions, but it seems simple enough. The clips can only go down one way. And it's got kind of this weight, I think, to keep pressure on them, to always push them down. It's also got a nice little stand on it so you can set it up and walk away. Uh, but I've tried out a few. Basically, you just push down on this handle here over top of a PEX, pushes it down in and clips in. Uh, the first one did kind of want to go out the side like this. It got stuck uh, trying to come one end come out here instead of uh, both coming out here. But um, that may just be how I was pushing down on it. But let's go ahead and run through a few hundred of these and see how they do. So far, so good. The tool hasn't failed once yet. As you can see, the boiler is going to go in this area over here. So I don't need to really go under the boiler. I put these 90 degree uh, PVC bends on it so they can come straight up. And I got a, enough left out here where the manifolds will sit up in here or up on the wall somewhere. Um, this stuff is, so far, super easy to work with. Obviously, it's still the middle of summer. It's 900 degrees outside. So it's not like this PEX is giving me any problems with it being cold and not really wanting to uncoil. 
obviously it's coiling as it as you unroll it this way but you just give it a little tug pull it straight super easy to put these clips on and to get it all down so so far i recommend that anyone could probably do this uh make it a little easier if a second person had this uh helping you unroll as you go through but uh this should be a pretty easy project uh, to complete and to do if you are wondering no i'm not following any specific layout i pretty much know how many runs i can get down if they're 12 inches on center to get back over to here so i know how many i need as you can see i'm not being 100 percent with it they're kind of moving no they are not 12 inches on center uh, my feet are a little over a foot so as you can see i'm more like uh 12 13 14 maybe 15 inches on center obviously this loop right here heck of a lot more than that but then heck of a lot closer together here my goal is just that a hot pipe runs more on the outside of something and the cold comes back to it and then the next run that we start you'll have another hot pipe so as this is the most hot coming from the boiler and this is the coldest as the 300 foot run is ending you put that next to another hot run coming right out of the boiler so these two hot pipes keep this pipe kind of more warm as it's coming back now obviously as i leave here as the garage door will start to be the coldest right here uh, because you'll have maybe a little bit of air movement underneath of the garage door it'll start to get cold in here so i'll make sure that i start cutting these runs or these loops back a little bit so i've got a hot run loop coming this way and going back to the boiler that way the front of this garage stays nice and warm and you don't get any uh, condensation or weird uh, uh, frost or anything building up uh, but my thought process with this being on this two inches of foam with five inches of concrete coming in here once you heat that concrete up it's got so much thermal mass that it's going to want to stay warm once you get it warm and the goal for this the garage is to only keep this garage at maybe 50 60 degrees if we're lucky i'll still be working on a car out here in jeans and a you know a lightweight jacket in the middle of winter so i don't need this slab toasty warm as long as i go down on it working under a car or anything like that and i can touch this and this slab is a good 60 degrees or so i'll be more than happy so i've seen people do runs where they're like less than a foot apart and to me inside of a house sure but for out here uh, with <laughs> this much insulation plus with the under slab and that concrete holding in all that thermal mass i think we'll be more than okay first run is done had to change the layout just a little bit i was already starting to make my way back on this loop and then go over to the manifold and then it dawned on me you really don't want to cross your pipes going up to a manifold so i had to think about well if my three returns are over here which originally i was thinking these would be my supplies so this is going to be the hotline well then it dawned on me well that's stupid because you, the hotline against the house is pointless and then running down along that icf wall is pointless so the hotline is now going to be over here so we're running further away from the house which is going to be the warmest spot and then we get down here keeping all this warm and then of course this is going to be the hottest line and it's running right in front of the garage door so that'll be nice and toasty and then as we start to come back over here we make the loop here these two to three here should still be pretty warm because they're still close to the hottest line and then again we can start to go ahead and drop some heat because this is uh, supported by the icf and that's supported by the icf and then that's supported by the icf and the house so that can go ahead and be the coldest line no sense in making that the warmest when this spot right here in the garage door is going to end up being the coldest so that's an exact 300 foot run so not a lot of room left in here to run 600 more feet so i can either start putting them super super close together or i guess i can leave this one let's say 300 feet 
and then these two zones in here we can go ahead and back them down to you know maybe like 250 250 let's go ahead and plan out the next run and let's see what we end up getting All right, I would say that's pretty much a job well done. It went a lot smoother than I thought. I was kind of getting worried about how you'll end in a run and get back, but I did change the layout slightly. Uh, I made the decision again to go ahead and route that these lines here would be the hot lines. I did start to run out of room uh, down in here. You can see I'm extremely close together all throughout here and if the sun can let me see it so I started putting them really really close together in these bends in here so when I got over to about here I started realizing oh no I'm gonna run out so these definitely started going more like oh I don't know close to the two foot mark but these runs in here in the single bay the single bay is not gonna hardly get opened at all so uh, a lot more traffic will be coming in through the double bay so this should stay nice and warm obviously again you got some big gaps here but remember that line that line and that line these three right here running that way those are the hottest lines those are going to be uh, what are supplying first so in here even though you got a big gap this concrete right in here should stay nice and hot and then as you can see as you get back in here it starts closing back up and you should be fine as these are most of the returns and again like this line here is a return but it's next to the house so it shouldn't be much of an issue but that was three runs 300 feet each i think i ended up using four and a half almost five boxes of the clips so that tells me how many i'm going to need for the uh the basement radiant when we do that but i think right now there's really nothing left to do. We got to get concrete ordered and get in on Friday. Uh, I'll probably wrap this video up here, check back with you on Friday, but just a quick install of some radiant heat, some vapor barrier, some two inch rigid foam under your slab so it stays nice and warm. And uh, yeah, not bad for a first time. So I will see you guys all later uh, this week on Friday for the pour. And I hope you st uh, stop back in. Please like and subscribe if you'd like to see more content. Turn the bell on so you can get notified when we do post new stuff. Uh, I'll probably upload that video hopefully Friday right after it's done. Uh, but again, thanks for stopping by. We're approaching 200 subscribers. I want to thank all of you. This is, uh, second 100 went a heck of a lot faster than the first. And uh, I'm glad you guys are all liking the content. We'll see you around.